general counsel to the New York Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Assange Extradition and the War on Journalism hosted by Popular Resistance. This webinar and press conference is an important update and discussion of the extradition trial of Julian Assange and the threat that it poses to the freedom of press in the United States and across the globe. I'm Susan Udry, I go by Sue, and my pronouns are she, her. I'm the executive director of a civil liberties group called Defending Rights and Dissent. We work to protect our right to know what our government is up to and the freedom to take action when the government is screwing up. The US government's prosecution of Julian Assange poses an extraordinary threat to our democracy and free press. And I applaud the organizers of this event who have assembled for us an all-star panel that is uniquely qualified to help us understand the context, the process, and the danger of this trial. One of those organizers, Kevin Zeese, passed away on Sunday, 
Uh, he was a friend and a comrade to me and a driving force in the progressive movement for 40 years. All of us who knew him and had the pleasure of working alongside him are devastated. Uh, we invite you to join us for an online tribute to Kevin on Saturday, September 19th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. We'll put the info in the Zoom chat and on the Facebook page. Um, so we're joined today by Dan Ellsberg, James Goodale, and Christopher Hedges to talk about the Assange extradition trial. James Goodale is the former vice chairman of the New York Times and author of Fighting for the Press, the inside story of the Pentagon paper and other battles, which was twice named as the best nonfiction year, book of the year. In 1971, he led the team of lawyers defending the New York Times from being enjoined under the Espionage Act for publishing the Pentagon papers. His team won. Thank goodness. Um, so James, what does, what does the Assange trial mean for journalists and press freedoms in the US? Well, everyone should understand that the government has been thirsting for over 50 years to bring this criminal action against those who are performing journalistic functions. 50 years ago, it tried to stop the Times from publication. Lawyers call that a civil case. It thereafter tried to bring a criminal case, very much like the Assange case, in which it was trying to show that Ellsberg conspired with the uh, uh, New York Times reporters to uh, violate the criminal laws of the United States, namely the Espionage Act. Now, they gave up on that case. It disappeared. But now, 50 years later, it's reemerged. What the government wants to prove is that when a reporter tries to get a leak by talking to a leaker, he, as a leaky, can be criminally convicted of a conspiracy for talking to a source. So what's involved here is a criminalization of the basic journalistic function, which is a reporter asks a source for information and thereafter is able to publish it. If that source has classified information and is leaking it, the government is saying they both go to jail. I would say there is one other similarity with the Pentagon Papers case, which turned out to have a lot of hooey in it, which the government made to seem very important, but it wasn't. It was stuff that had already been published in the New York Times. The government does not have a case here really against Assange for publishing information that violates national security. The information informed the public he published. It did not damage national security. The government can show no damage to national security in this case, and indeed can show that no individual was damaged by this publication. So keep in mind, this is the other side of the Pentagon Papers case that was never decided, but the information that's involved in it is of no more importance in terms of damage to national security as it was in the first instance. Thank you. Thanks so much, James. Um, so I want to turn to now to, to you, Dan um, Ellsberg. You're one of the witnesses for the defense in Assange's trial. Um, I think you were supposed to testify today, but it got put, put off. Um, I'm sure you don't need an introduction. Uh, Dan is the courageous whistleblower ex who exposed the truths of the Vietnam War to the American people via the Pentagon Papers in 1971. Um, Dan, can you talk a little bit about, about um, what your, what your, when you do testify, um, what points you'll be raising um, for the defense in the Assange trial? Dan, I don't know if you're trying to talk, but you're muted. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you. I need to talk more to the lawyers than they've had a chance to do yet. Exactly, that's how, uh, what they want me to bring out for the benefit of the judge 
in this case, there's no jury uh, talking to a judge here to try to convince her that she should not extradite uh, Julian Assange to the United States. And the stakes here are such that if the United States can extradite and prosecute Julian Assange or someone like Julian Assange, a foreign, a foreigner to the United States living abroad uh, who has revealed true information and true documents, then no journalist in the world is who uh, wants to publish information like that provided by Chelsea Manning or Ed Snowden is safe from the prospects of life imprisonment in the United States. Thus, this, this directly can, uh, affects the interest, not just of the reporters, but the interest they serve, which is the possibility of democracy in various places, which is threatened very much in this country right now. Uh, they want to close down, in other words, unauthorized disclosures, meaning that the news we have of what our government is doing in our name, with our tax money, and to other people in the world is uh, based entirely on government handouts, uh, as it is in some places in the world, like I take it, China or Stalinist, Stalinist Russia, various places, the end of a republic, essentially, of any kind of public sovereignty. Now, as I follow the tweets on this by Kevin Gostola and uh, Joe Laurie of Consortium News, um, Craig Murray and some others, following it, I'm forced to relive a trial, my trial, that I had hoped not to have to think about ever again. I swore at the end of my trial, two, almost two years in court, that I would never write a word about it, and I never have, because I just couldn't bear to relive it again. And I can understand very well uh, uh, Julian's feelings when just yesterday he expostulated, you know, uh, this is nonsense or uh, other times he'll want to say, this is a lie as he hears these things. And having to bottle up those feelings for a matter of months is, uh, is an experience I didn't want to think about or relive again, very stressful. But the judge warned him, of course, in this case, that he would be expelled from the courtroom if he did that again. So uh, the point is that I was the first to face the charges that he's now faced with uh, alleged violations of the Espionage Act, and in his case, computer uh, cases, which didn't exist in my day. Uh, and the reason for that, that I was the first, was not that there had been no leaks before that. There, every other day, there had been leaks, and important ones very constantly. But that we don't have an official Secrets Act, such as is in the minds, I'm sure, of the judge and the prosecutors as I read them, uh, they take for granted that the law in the United States is equivalent to that of the uh, British, the Official Secrets Act, which criminalizes any revelation of protected information, information whatever the purpose, whatever the target, uh, no question of motive or uh, circumstances or public benefit, uh, it's just all criminal. And uh, we don't have such an act in this country because we have a First Amendment, which they don't. Which, and the, I don't think I've ever seen it said exactly, but the British Official Secrets Act would surely not pass constitutional muster under the First Amendment in this country. I say surely, uh, I'm saying even with this, for, this Supreme Court, well, you can't say uh, what they would, what five people <laughs> say. But certainly when I was facing it, it was clear that uh, that would be a violation, the, that act would be a violation of our First Amendment, which forbids uh, restraint on the, on the press and on information. But nevertheless, starting with my case, for I, a succession of administrations, has tried to use or has used the Espionage Act intended for spies who give secret information to a foreign power, especially an enemy in time of war, and don't have much of a public interest defense to rely on. So the lack of it is not a, a terrible violation of their rights. But to apply that for what is not meant to, to whistleblowers who are trying to reveal wrongdoing or information that the public has a right to know and should know, and that has been wrongfully withheld from them, um, to apply that, and not only to apply it, but in the sense of a strict liability law where they can't even explain their 
motives and the reasons that uh, led them to believe reasonably uh, that this information was wrongfully withheld and that the secrecy was dangerous and was causing harm and lives. They couldn't argue that at all. I was not allowed to say to my jury, answer the question, why did you copy the Pentagon Papers? And after trying a number of times uh, to get that question through in different ways, my lawyer, Leonard Boudin, said to the judge, Matthew Byrne, who, unknown to us, had been offered the post of the FBI if he got the trial through expeditiously and with the right effect. And I think the right effect did not allow him to see an acquittal of me on 12 felony counts, all of them. But we didn't know that. And otherwise, I would have said we had a fair trial up to that point with a very intelligent judge. And the lawyer said, Your Honor, I've never heard of a trial where the defendant could not tell the jury why he had done what he did. And the jury, and the judge said, you're hearing one now. And at that point, I see the full implications of that right away. But for the last 50 years, I've had to reflect, no, I didn't get a fair trial. It was not available to me under these charges. And it wouldn't be available to Julian, and it hasn't been available to any of the people that have been tried since. One, 10 years after me, it took that long because they were so aware of the unconstitutionality of this process, but they tried it again 10 years later. Uh, then another 10 years or so went by. Obama, with a historical record then of three prosecutions before him, prosecuted nine people under this and Trump has done even more. And what's new now is that for the first time, they are attempting to use it against not just a former official who signed a secrecy agreement, which he's violating, which I violated, a promise that I broke because I felt it had been wrong for me to promise such a thing in these circumstances. Okay, but someone who's never made such a promise is not an official, a journalist protected by the First Amendment, freedom of the press, uh, is now for the first time actually being indicted. As James Goodell said earlier, they set out to indict the New York Times in my case, but backed off on that. So this is the first actual indictment. And if it succeeds, there won't be anything left of the First Amendment with respect to reporting on what the government defines as national security. And that really means their personal bureaucratic uh, interest uh, security, their political security, what not everything of that gets stamped with a secrecy stamp. So the public's ability to hold uh, public officials accountable in this vast field of military matters and national security will be essentially nil, except for heroes who are prepared to go to jail for life. Uh, he, uh, Julian, is facing 175 years in prison. I only faced 115. So we can see that things have deteriorated aside from the fact that he is a journalist. This should be of the immediate concern, not, not only personally, but for their profession and the role they play in our country for every journalist. And they have not yet awakened to that. They've been in a state of denial, I would say, for 50 years as to the threat that was hanging over their head. Well, that threat is now uh, directly confronting them. So I hope that people will follow this and the, lawyer and the journalists will at last make themselves aware of the constitutional aspects of this prospect. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, and and I and I think it's true. The, the First Amendment is the foundation. I don't know if I'm echoing for everybody or not. Um, the the First Amendment is really the the foundation of our democracy. And so so Chris Hedges, I wanted to I wanted to turn to you. Um, Chris Hedges is a longtime activist and rabble rouser. He's also a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and a New York Times bestselling author and television host. But, but Chris, the impact of these attempts to prosecute Assange and, and whistleblowers under the Espionage Act um, have implications actually far beyond press freedom and press, <laughs> press freedom and the First Amendment. I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about that and, and what are your concerns about this trial? Uh, you are the voice of God. Okay. All right. Oh, is that all right? 
So, Chris, um, do you have a headphone that you could put on really quickly? Uh, yeah. All right, let's try that. Okay, is that okay, better? Sadly, that, that, that is not. Do you have a yeah. phone on or anything that other thing that has the panelists that, that has this on? You're just on your computer? I'm only on the computer. computer. Okay. You're the only one who has sound right now. Um, okay, yeah, someone's asking if there are two devices in the room. They're not. So um, see if you can go to your settings for your. Um, Let's see, for your microphone. Um, I don't know if there's anything there that you can try audio settings and see if you can turn your mic down. You can change the volume on your mic. If you go to the um, little microphone, click on the arrow, go to audio settings. When you've got that, let's try again. Okay, how's this? Oh, someone is, yeah, that sounds much better. Okay. Um, great. So uh, I wanna echo, of course, everything that uh, uh, James and Dan said about what this will mean for press freedom. Uh, but I also wanna highlight how there has been uh, from the moment uh, Julian was charged a kind of gross distortion of the rule of law itself uh, in order to carry out what is in essence an illegal activity, uh, an assault against the First Amendment, an assault against journalism. Uh, you had the United States pressure the president of Ecuador, Lenin Moreno, uh, to terminate uh, Julian Assange's rights of asylum as a political refugee. Uh, then you had uh, Moreno uh, be pressured again by the United States. He got a large IMF loan after this to authorize British police to enter the, the Ecuadorian embassy in London. This is diplomatically sanctioned sovereign territory to arrest uh, Julian's an Australian, but he's also a, a naturalized citizen of Ecuador. Uh, you had th then Prime Minister Theresa May uh, authorize uh, the police to uh, kidnap and hold Julian, who's never been, never committed a crime. Uh, and then you had uh, Trump uh, demand his extradition, although uh, as uh, was mentioned, he's not a US citizen and WikiLeaks is not a US based news organization. And then in the trial itself. So they had the first indictment, this was in March, 2018. Uh, January 2019, they had a provisional request for extradition uh, that was implemented uh, with Assange's removal from the embassy in April of that year. Uh, and then in June of 2019, uh, this was replaced by a second indictment, uh, which was uh, supposed to be the basis of the current uh, proceedings. Uh, and so all of the hearings up until now I had taken place on the basis of the second indictment. So then what did the United States do? Uh, they were worried that they would not be able to extradite him uh, under the Espionage Act. So they uh, wrote a superseding indictment uh, that dated from June 20th, uh, even though the, the hearings kept going based on the second indictment uh, and the defense was never properly informed about this superseding indictment. They only learned about its existence through a press release last June. Uh, and then they were only officially served, uh, I think, the end of July. That was about six weeks ago. Uh, and what we've seen, in essence, is that the United States government, uh, through this superseding indictment, uh, has uh, uh, changed the charges uh, leveled against Julian. And the new charges 
uh, uh, that don't depend on the earlier allegations have nothing to do with the Espionage Act. Uh, they uh, are about stealing data from a bank and from the government of Iceland, about passing on information on tracking police vehicles, hacking the computers of a security firm, uh, helping Edward Snowden escape to Kong, Hong Kong, although Assange was never charged with this crime, uh, in uh, charging that Assange encouraged people to hack computers, uh, track police vehicles in Iceland, et cetera. So uh, what they've done is uh, essentially uh, create a whole series of new charges uh, that uh, without any real evidence that are in fact criminal to push through the extradition. And then of course he will be charged uh, without doubt uh, if he is extradited under uh, the 17 counts of the Espionage Act and the, the account of attempting to break into a government computer, which is 175 years. But I think that, that those kinds of details illustrate how the rule of law itself has been distorted uh, and uh, ignored and, and trampled on uh, in order to push through this case. So it's not just that we are looking at an assault against the First Amendment rights of a journalist, or I would call Julian a publisher, uh, uh, to publish this material. Uh, but we're seeing, I think, a very frightening kind of uh, erosion uh, within the British and American courts of the rule of law itself. Thank you so much. Um, so, so that concludes our opening statements. And I'd like to open this, um, this press conference slash webinar to um, questions from the media. So in order to do that, I'm gonna ask um, that, let's, let's allow journalists to have the first chance to ask questions. If you want to raise your hands, for, for those of you not familiar with the Zoom platform, um, underneath the, the um, video screen of, of our participants, you should see a, a, an icon that says participants. If you click on that, um, it should open up a screen for you where you're able to raise your hand. There's a, a, a box um, underneath the list of participants and you can click on that to raise your hand. It'll show for me and I'll be able to call on you and we'll be able to unmute you. Um, let's hope this works. So if you'd like to raise your hand and ask a question, um, go ahead. Um, Okay, I'm not seeing any questions yet from journalists. You also can type a question in the chat box or put your name in the chat box and ask me to call on you. Hello. Hi. Hi, um, my name is Gabriela Vivanco. I'm from Laura newspaper in Ecuador and um, my question is regarding the involvement of Ecuador's government and if there is any actual um, evidence that the change of policy regarding Mr. Assange uh, with the Lenin Moreno's government um, and with the IMF loans that the country has been getting, um, if there is any uh, either evidence or stronger uh, correlation between uh, the policy and the and the fact that Mr. Assange was um, allegedly granted citizenship under circumstances, um, which is what the government says. Uh, well, um, let, let me talk about what I know since I made those charges. Uh, there's ab absolute evidence that the United States uh, began to put heavy pressure on Lenin Moreno uh, to push Assange out. Michael Penn, uh, the vice president, made a trip there. Uh, the IMF loan uh, was uh, clearly held up, U.S. officials admitted, as a kind of reward for compliance. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, what actually took place within the uh, highest levels of the Ecuadorian government, I don't know. Uh, you might know, uh, but I do know that there was a lot of pressure put on Moreno 
uh, by the U.S. government uh, to uh, facilitate the uh, seizure of Assange within on sovereign Ecuadorian territory in London. Uh, and uh, of course, we had preceding that April seizure, uh, a series of harassing uh, moves that were carried. Life became exceedingly difficult for uh, Julian inside um, the embassy. They cut his visitors. They cut access to the internet. They, there was, uh, I mean, they were, what they were really trying to do was kind of push him out uh, on his own volition. Uh, and that didn't work. And so they allowed the British police to go in. Uh, but that the United States uh, put a lot of pressure on Moreno and that that IMF, IMF loan came through uh, once Moreno uh, was willing to uh, hand Julian over is, is fact. Thanks, Chris. Um, Dan or James, did you want to jump in there? Anything more to add? No. Okay. Um, are there any other journalists? I'm, I'm apologize. I'm not seeing any hands raised. If there are any other journalists who have questions, um, raise your hand or type it into the chat box. If not, um, I think I can open it up to other folks, but we've got a couple of, of, um, questions that came in through the Q and A function of, um, of Zoom, and, and one person is asking uh, whether or not you feel that Julian's health should be a factor in extradition consideration. Well, I can, I can answer that generally because there is some law uh, in the English extradition cases that uh, reflects the fact that the health of the person being extradited uh, should be taken into consideration, which shouldn't surprise anybody. And also uh, there is uh, material in the British extradition cases that allows the extraditing judge uh, to consider the conditions of uh, confinement once the person has been extradited. So uh, the health uh, of Julian, which has uh, been stated to uh, not be very good at all, uh, uh, has to be taken into consideration uh, by this judge. Uh, in theory, the prison conditions of the United States should be a factor uh, too. Uh, we all know that the prison population in the United States is at an all-time high as and it has been increasing over at least a, a decade and I said to introduce this statement in theory uh, because I'm not sure from what I can see of the actions of the court uh, whether this will be uh, of interest uh, to the court but to that yes is the answer. Thanks, James. Um, anybody else want to chime in on that? Well, if I may just... Dan, you, you muted yourself. Okay. There you go. Okay, it's just pay attention. The conditions of his confinement seem to have been outrageous here for the time that he's been. Uh, in England. Uh, why he's held in isolation, and of course there's some benefit to that in the pandemic now, I suppose, but in general, the idea that he continues to be in isolation. Uh, this is a man who hasn't been out in the sun for how many years? Close to nine years, I would say. And uh, when I saw him in England, he was already had great trouble with his shoulder, uh, which he's still complaining of, according to his partner, and uh, his uh, teeth condition which required examinations that couldn't be made in the Ecuadorian prison. I'm not aware that he's ever gotten the medical attention that he really needs. Uh, I understand that uh, almost 200 doctors have said that his conditions require, uh, you know, that it's wrong for him to be in the conditions that he's been in and he should be, even while being detained, should be uh, get the hospital care 
that he needs. So they're torturing him as two successive rapporteurs for the UN for torture and inhumane conditions have each judged, along with many other doctors and lawyers, that he's being held conditions that amount to torture, or as he put it, at the very least, to inhumane uh, conditions altogether that's violating that. I would say that, um, uh, as somebody put it, if he dies, which could very possibly be the case in prison, he will have been tortured to death. And that's a, uh, I, I suspect actually, in these prolonged uh, proceedings, that the United States would be very happy to see him die before he ever gets to air his issues in a court. Uh, they prefer that. So uh, uh, Britain is, is showing up very badly under these circumstances, under these conditions. It deserves great protest. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Um, th there's a question for you, Chris. Um, what real chance do you feel that Julian actually has of the British government not extraditing him? Close to zero. Uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't fight uh, as hard as we can. Uh, and uh, there's always that uh, slim chance that we can win. Uh, I sued Barack Obama uh, in 2012 over Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act, which in essence overturned the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act, which prohibits the government from using the U.S. military as a police force. Uh, no one thought we would win. The lawyers, Bruce Afron and Carl Mayer, didn't think we were going to win. Uh, Dan joined us as a plaintiff uh, in this case, uh, along with Noam Chomsky and others. And in fact, Catherine B. Forrest in the Southern District Court of New York uh, ruled in our favor and issued a temporary injunction, which was overturned by the Second Circuit. Uh, so uh, I think we, uh, when we carried out that action, it was to bring it to light, to bring the egregious violation of law um, uh, in the same way that I think all of us are attempting to shine a spotlight on the persecution, unjust persecution and evisceration of law, uh, which has been used uh, against uh, Julian, um, uh, but I mean, honestly, especially watching uh, Baritzer in this court uh, with her, who is, uh, I, I sat in on the last hearing in London and I was going, except for COVID, I would have been there. Although now, of course, nobody's getting in the courtroom. Uh, they, they had 40 spots for journalists and they were all shunted aside to another room uh, where the audio, uh, they couldn't hear the court proceedings through the audio. That wasn't accidental. I have British press credentials through the National Union of Journalists. Uh, I should be have been given a link. I requested one uh, uh, as a member of the British press, uh, and I was just denied a link. There were only 16 journalists who were allowed to listen yesterday, uh, and it's in and out. Um, so I think the British government is working very hard to hide this kind of Dickensian farce uh, that it's undergoing because it's an embarrassment. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's no, the, the, first of all, there's a conflict of interest with the judge herself because her husband is part of the defense industry. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, you know, you, you'd have to be extremely naive to think that somehow this is a real trial or a real judicial process, as Dan mentioned in his own case. Uh, it's a lynching. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, you know, it, it, we have to fight for all the reasons James pointed out. The consequences of this, and I speak as someone who published classified information on the front pages of the New York Times, the consequences of this are truly, truly terrifying. Uh, and I can't stress that enough um, as, as a journalist. Um. Thank you. Uh, I, there's a, a few questions from people who are who are jumping ahead, um, also feeling that um, that this trial is a sham and that he will be extradited. Um, he'll face trial here in the United States then. And and people want to know um, kind of two questions. First, on the personal question about Julian Assange himself, what sort of if he is convicted, particularly under the Espionage Act, what sort of rights of appeal does he have? But then also, if he is extradited and found guilty, then, then what happens to political journalism as a profession? Um, will this type of news no longer exist? Will it somehow go underground? Um, 
what's on the horizon. <laughs> you know, the best person to answer this is James, but just let me, before he does, say that in many ways that's already happened. Uh, because of the wholesale surveillance, and I know because I did investigative reporting for the New York Times, I have friends who still do it, uh, government officials are terrified to talk. Uh, and this was really Obama. Uh, they're terrified to talk because they know uh, that they can be charged under the Espionage Act. Obama did that nine times, Kiriakou, Snowden, all sorts of others. Uh, and, uh, and so in many ways, it's only those people who hack into systems, people like Chelsea Manning, people like Jeremy Hammond, who hacked into Stratfor, the private security firm, and dumped, I think, five million emails, which, by the way, we used in our uh, trial uh, uh, challenging Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act because it showed private security firms and homeland security officials actively trying to tie uh, dissident American groups, not, 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 I'm not talking about like Al Qaeda or anything, but just uh, dissident American groups to Islamic terrorists um, as a way to use terrorism laws to go after them. So uh, I, I'll, let, I'll let James uh, you know, deal with the legal aspect of that, but I think it's important to know that there's always been, already been a terrible chilling effect on the ability of investigative journalists to shine a light into the inner workings of power. Thanks, Thanks Chris. James, do you wanna to add to that? Well, I, I, I want to reiterate what the government is trying to do is close the loop, uh, which is half uh, open, half closed. Because as Dan points out, even under Obama, there have been multiple prosecutions of sources, leakers, which never happened before. When Dan and I started off in this world 50 years ago, it never happened. It's now happened and there are multiple examples of the government criminalizing leaking. The question before the uh, extradition court and for the referring court back, if indeed uh, this case goes back to the United States, is you can, can you close the loop and make the receipt of the leak also criminal? Uh, because the um, uh, leakers know of the prosecutions, uh, it is uh, my experience, but it's not the same as Chris, of course, that leaks have dried up. So you can expect that if they close the loop, it's going to be very difficult uh, for leaking to uh, exist because it'll just be too dangerous for everybody, for everybody. With respect to the second part of the question, can it be appealed? The uh, action, if any, in the United States, uh, well, you know, it's not clear whether the question is uh, an appeal of the extradition proceeding or an appeal if you were to lose back the United States. It may be the latter. And I'm not um, an expert on the human rights law of, um, the, of Europe, but my understanding is there will be attempts to appeal should the extradition be ordered through the human rights uh, procedures that are available to Assange uh, in uh, Europe. With respect to the question of an appeal, this is a hypothetical and a hypothetical of a loss in a court in the United States, the Supreme Court of the United States, obviously yes. Question then becomes, what do you think this court will do? I'm not optimistic. This Supreme Court will do, I'm not optimistic that they would uh, be uh, as favorable as our court was 50 years ago toward leaking. Yeah, thank you, James. Um, did you wanna jump in there, Dan? I have another question I'd like to ask James that I see a question from somebody here and I'd like to ask James on this. I don't understand how this is going on with the lawyers unable to confer uh, to a full extent with their defendant. Uh, with their client. Uh, I think the lawyer said yesterday that they hadn't seen him for months and had talked to him on the phone and a very bad connection uh, only a couple of times. Uh, they they delayed the court for 30 minutes yesterday to allow them to talk 
to their client, apparently for the first time. At least one of the lawyers had never met him before. Now, what's going on here? I don't see how this can be a legal process. What's happening? Well, uh, I don't know what's going on because I'm not there. All I know is what I read. Uh, and by the way, my client here is not Julian Assange. It's the First Amendment. So I'm not in contact necessarily with the Assange defense team. So my knowledge is based on what I what I read. And uh, I what I read is that there's no due process in this case. Uh, that uh, for uh, months, the lawyers could not get to Assange when he was in prison. Uh, he is uh, furthermore, or was, I'm not sure what happened today or yesterday in the trial, but was, can you believe it, in a glass cage in the courtroom. Now let's not forget that. It seems to me, I, I get angry just thinking about it, being a lawyer who wants to talk with his defendant uh, as the case goes on, and he can't because the defendant in this case is in a glass cage or was in a courtroom. Can you believe of anything as primitive uh, as that? Uh, Mr. S Mr. Assange uh, is not a terrorist. Uh, he is a uh, representative of a new breed of intellectual uh, that has come to fore because of the digital revolution whose intellect is into uh, uh, digitalization. Uh, a subject I don't understand very well, but he's not somebody who uses his hands to murder people. He uses his hands to access information and to take someone who's intellectually inclined or in any event and put that person in a glass cage, not make him available to his lawyers is absolutely primitive. Yes, <laughs> thank you. And and that um, that kind of reminds me, um, Chris. I was I was rereading the interview that you did with Assange back in I think 2013. You traveled over to the Ecuadorian embassy and and you opened that that um, article talking about just the surveillance and the, um, the the militarized presence of the police around the Ecuadorian embassy as if you know, creating this really um, impression of Julian Assange as a highly dangerous. Do, do you want to comment on that and, and your relationship why, with Assange? Yeah, well, that's why he's in the glass cage. Mm -hmm. uh, because every, all of the uh, kind of uh, the, the, the stage set, whether it was outside the embassy, which had uh, all sorts of police officials and a police van with uh, all sorts of monitoring, electronic monitoring, eavesdropping equipment. Uh, it, it is to present him as a terrorist. Uh, I, it, 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 this is one of the, in the last hearing when I was in London, uh, the, uh, the defense asked that he be allowed to sit at the table with them. And the, and the prosecution didn't object, um, but the judge refused to move him out of the cage. Uh, and it's for that reason. It, it, it's, a, it's a matter of presentation. Um, it's not a matter of security. It's, uh, as James said, uh, you know, legally suspect at best. Um, but yes, that's right. It's, that's, they, uh, they attempt to uh, create um, uh, you know, a kind of uh, ambience or a kind of uh, 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 with, with all of the props to essentially uh, when, you, when you look at that, when you looked at the embassy or when you look at him in the glass cage to tar him with, uh, you know, that tag of being a terrorist. That's, that's why he's in the cage. Yeah, excuse me for, saying, for adding, but let's not forget he was eavesdropped uh, by the CIA through a Spanish contractor uh, when he was in prison, his communications with lawyers were subject to such eavesdropping. 
all the information that was obtained, which was obtained by putting micro secret microphones in the bathroom, uh, in his bedroom, uh, everywhere, all the information that was uh, gained through that process was sent back to the CIA uh, in the United States. Some uh, stories said that it was sent back in live time. That is a clear violation of due process and is quite comparable to what the uh, government did to Dan Ellsberg by breaking into his office to get his psychiatric, psychiatric information. Uh, 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 and this took place in Los Angeles and it was when brought to the attention of the court in which Dan was tried, uh, influential in the court's decision to dismiss that case. It is my view, there is no difference between what the CIA has done here and what was done to Dan, and that's the grounds for dismissal of the case. It, it would seem, if I can hear me, it, it would seem that there's a possibility here uh, <laughs> that this could not only lead to a dismissal of the case, as it should, it would seem to me, that he was being overheard with his lawyers the reason they had surveillance in the bathroom was that in fear of surveillance, he was having discussions with his lawyer in the bathroom where there was surveillance at that point. So they were overhearing that uh, deliberately. That, not only is that grounds for dismissal, remember in my case, actually, Jim, uh, the judge refused to say that having either offered him the um, uh, head of the FBI director, he said that was of no consequence because it wasn't a grounds for dismissal because it hadn't influenced him. But uh, this pattern of things included warrantless wiretaps on which I'd been overheard and which the FBI had repeatedly denied that they had and they convicted. And then the final outcry was when the, when the judge asked for the records of the wiretaps, he said they couldn't find the records which was true because the number two man in the CIA, in the, in the FBI, had turned them over to the White House so that uh, Hoover could not blackmail the White House with the existence of these illegal records and so forth. And that was a critical thing in dismissing my case. But more than that, in this country, it was an illegality which confronted the president with impeachment proceedings and led to his resignation and helped shorten the war. Now, if we want to look for a bright thing in this, uh, it's not impossible, and it's unlikely, but it's not impossible that illegalities involved in this, which seem to be manifold, and the case you mentioned is this surveillance in particular, uh, could actually redound, uh, you know, uh, to the administration and uh, be, be a charge, not only in dismissing the case, I just want to add, James and Jim and uh, Dan are talking about the Spanish private security firm, Undercover yes. Global. Uh, so yes, they provided the CIA with audio and video recordings, including, of course, as Dan said, with a lawyer. But they also photographed the passports of all the visitors, including mine uh, and Dan. Uh, they would take the phones, which were not permitted into the embassy. They opened them. Uh, I don't know why, probably in an effort to intercept calls. Um, they would steal data from laptops and electronic tablets and USB sticks, which we were all required to leave in the embassy reception area. Uh, they compiled detail of Julian's meetings and conversations with visitors. Uh, and uh, of course, the famous uh, uh, move, they tried to steal the diaper of uh, a baby uh, to perform a DNS, DNA test to establish whether this was Julian's uh, son. Uh, and they worked at the behest of the CIA. So what does that mean? It means that the prosecution uh, has all of the transcripts of uh, the meetings between Julian and his, his attorneys. I think that one thing that uh, I learned from the Pentagon Papers case, and uh, this has been proven to me following uh, such uh, national security cases since, don't get into litigation with the Justice Department with respect to national security, because they are totally amoral in this regard. They will do anything. You cannot trust them. They will lie. They will cheat. Uh, if I may point out, 
uh, in the Pentagon Papers case, they caused the former dean of the Harvard Law School, Erwin Griswold, to lie to the Supreme Court to say that the Pentagon Papers broke the Vietnam Code, which is absolute total nonsense. You cannot trust them. Uh, it is a very difficult fight to get into. But if you catch them, there is a chance, you know, that something will happen <laughs> if they're caught. Uh, they have almost total Im impunity, but not 100%. Let me make one little comment on, as I say, I'm reliving this case. When I saw that, that Julian had stood up and said, this is nonsense, and been warned, been warned by the judge, and I thought how many times I'd wanted to say that during my trial. However, in my trial, I'm sitting at a defense table with my lawyers, uh, never being looked at by the judge at all. You know, a silent, as though you're invisible. He looks at the defense attorneys, the lawyers, the, the reporters uh, didn't come to me at all because they went to the prosecution table not to look biased in, uh, in my favor and whatnot. So you're sitting there and I like Julian knowing a lot more about the Pentagon Papers that were being testified than, of course, my lawyers were able to do, uh, or the prosecutor. Here, Julian, as you say, knowing the digital aspects of this and the content far more than anybody else in the cartoon, in the, uh, in the courtroom, at least I was able to pass almost continuously notes to my lawyers, even, and this drove them crazy. I don't know how much they hated me for this, but I would give them notes while they were on the stand, ask this. <laughs> Or as that, you know, you can imagine as a lawyer uh, how irritating that would be. But I couldn't couldn't resist. And sometimes they did ask the question. Julian is sitting there in that glass cage, uh, and um, uh, which, by the way, they said the big difference from before is it has no top, so he can hear better. But he's sitting in that glass cage; he can't pass notes to anybody or do anything. It must be driving him crazy. I'm sure it is, if, if everything else hasn't already done that. Yeah. Um, so so um, I want to, I know that some new people have joined on. I just want to um, repeat the instructions that uh, particularly if you're a journalist and would like to ask a question, please use the raise hand function in Zoom, which you get to by clicking on participants, and then it should give you a um a, a dialog box opens up on the right hand side and there's a box where you can click to hit raise hand. Um, but I, but we, meanwhile, we have a lot of written in questions. Um, I, I want to ask a, here's a, um, a red meat question for you all. Will the uh, change, if, if there is a change in administrations come um, January, does, will that anyhow, how do you think that'll impact Assange's trial if he is expedited? extradited here to the United States? Not at all, because the Democratic Party is furious with Assange for publishing 70,000 hacked emails belonging to the DNC and senior Democratic officials. They were <coughs> John Podesta <coughs> was Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign chairman. Uh, and those emails uh, were uh, exposed the hypocrisy of uh, Clinton herself in terms of her telling Wall Street one thing and uh, telling, uh, you know, saying another thing on the campaign. It exposed uh, the donation of millions of dollars to the Clinton Foundation by Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Uh, it, it exposed the amount of money that Goldman Sachs paid to Clinton, $657,000 for three talks, uh, which I think is such a ridiculously large sum. It can only be considered a bribe. Uh, and uh, as well as, by the way, the Clinton campaign's efforts to influence the Republican nomination to make sure that Trump was uh, the nominee. And then finally, Clinton's uh, deep involvement as one of the architects of the war in Libya because she believed it would burnish her credentials as a presidential candidate. So they've earned the enmity of the Democratic Party. Uh, and we should not forget that uh, uh, WikiLeaks also made public the hacking tools used by the CIA and the NSA uh, and their interference in foreign elections, including the French election. So uh, it, it's, uh, you know, that WikiLeaks was tolerated uh, when it went after the war crimes by the Bush administration, uh, but it has no friends. And, and Hillary Clinton him, 
herself uh, quipped that, you know, uh, Julian should be taken out with a militarized drone. Uh, so the, the uh, aggressiveness of the effort to extradite Julian will be as fierce under uh, a Biden administration as under a Trump administration. Thanks for that, Chris. Um, Dan or James, did you want to jump in on that? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I think that uh, uh, Chris has two uh, arguments that are very difficult uh, to meet, and that is the DNC leak and the use of the, of the uh, tools which um, permitted hacking. Uh, he reported how that worked. Um, there is no question that the DNC uh, uh, break-in public, I don't mean that break-in, DNC leak uh, is very influential and I think is the principal reason that uh, Assange has no journalistic support in the United States. However, I am naive enough to think that maybe someone in the Biden, if it is Biden, I hope it is uh, administration, uh, has a First Amendment uh, quirk uh, that uh, they will uh, do what Obama did and uh, terminate the prosecution. I think there's some chance of that happening, though. I wouldn't put it above 50%. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dan, did you want to add anything? You know, Jim was saying earlier, good deal, that they've wanted for years to have the perfect candidate for a case against a journalist. And they, for years now, both the Obama administration, even though they backed off, um, and, uh, and this administration, see Assange as a candidate for that because people like Bill Keller and others were willing to say, I don't see him as a journalist. Uh, I think uh, very much to the discredit of, of Keller to say that and not to recognize the differences in the digital age here of uh, the effect of journalism. But uh, also, as Jim said, uh, he then lost the sympathy of a very wide range of people by his role in 2016. And without going into that so much, I don't, don't know whether people have really adjusted to the fact he not charged uh, with those, at least he wasn't in the second indictment, and I don't, I'm not aware that he has in the superseding indictment with anything he did in 2016, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we're talking about 2010. And uh, where I would say his uh, you know, entirely, entirely different issue. But it is true then that the, I think a reason that journalists have backed off from realizing how strongly this case affects each and every one of them. And I'm saying in the world, not just in uh, not just in the U.S. Uh, is that they uh, are, don't sympathize with Julian Assange as a person because of the judgments he made in the year 2016 during the election, and that's very short-sighted. I I would be in this position. I've said this. It sounds almost hard to believe, but I think in my heart it is believable. I would be arguing this case as strongly if Stephen Bannon were in exactly the same position in London. And he's a guy whose you know, views and judgments and practices I despise, I loathe. And yet, if he were being uh, extradited or tried for actions at Breitbart, however much you can argue whether Breitbart is journalism, it's certainly engaged journalism, to say the least, if not propaganda. But nevertheless, I would back Breitbart's uh, ability to publish this material and to be free from extradition, as I do for Julian. And I do like Julian, as a matter of fact. He is a friend, but that's not why I'm testing for him, testifying for him here. It's because of the issues uh, that go beyond any question of personality. Let me just add, you can, could, I suppose, as journalists have, and others have made the argument that uh, uh, you know, Julian should not have released uh, the information in the Podesta emails. Uh, but really what you're saying is the American public, the public doesn't have a right to know. Uh, and at that point, I don't think you can call yourself a journalist. Uh, we are not, we are not in the service. We're in the service of providing as much transparency and truth 
uh, about power, no matter who is in power, Democrat, Republican, or anyone else. Uh, and so I think, uh, as Dan has pointed out, the fact that so many in the press have turned their back on him, well, not only after using his information, publishing it page after page in publications like The Guardian, The New York Times, and others, uh, but they still refer to it. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, that, that is one of the great, I think, shames of the press. You know, the, when I say that journalists all over the world would be subject to this, I don't see why uh, the British journalists who published the information no. that uh, Chelsea Manning provided to uh, Sajan, he turned over to the Observer and the Guardian, Le Monde, uh, Der Spiegel and other places. Why aren't they equally subject to extradition? Is there, is there any legal basis why they're not as uh, subject? I was glad to see that Alan Rushberger of the, uh, his name, of the former observer has denounced this, uh, this process, but others have not. And he said, am I wrong? They are equally, uh, equally indictable, it seems to me. Uh, I think that's a good point, Dan, that we haven't focused on, uh, particularly, which is that uh, Julian uh, is being accused of publishing uh, information uh, that violates the Espionage Act. And therefore, anyone similarly situated, which would mean in this case, the New York Times, Der Spiegel, Il Monde, uh, uh, the Spanish paper. Hi. I did pretty well to remember them all, but uh, most of them are uh, equally uh, liable for uh, such publication, which means that they could be criminally uh, 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 accused and uh, they could be indicted too. That is uh, one of the great dangers of the case. The first time that the Espionage Act has been used against publication. And let's remember the notorious John Mitchell wanted to do the very same thing against the New York Times and paneled a grand jury on a conspiracy theory, just like this last indictment, which Dan referred to, a huge conspiracy, including Sarah Harrison, everybody you've ever heard of, all lumped together in this, in this indictment. The government wanted to do the very same thing uh, 50 years ago, they wanted to include Dan uh, Sheehan, who was the reporter, Noam Chomsky, everybody who was in the Boston area where Dan used to live. Hendrick Smith. An indictment reaching out with no connection to one another, which is what they've done with this, in with the with this indictment, and put them all in a great big conspiracy indictment for... Uh, uh, aiding and abetting the publication of the uh, Pentagon Papers. And so therefore, all of the above could be applied to all who published, which included the New York Times. I didn't mention the New York Times published in my list. I assumed everyone knew. And by the way, I, I repeat, how about being extradited? As I understand, uh, the, the Luke Harding, if I'm not mistaken, uh, <coughs> not only helped publish this, through Assange in the, oh, was it the Guardian or the Observer? I've forgotten, uh, the Observer, anyway, British paper. He published a book about it and used as the epigraph for one of the chapters, the full password, which had never been published for an entire unredacted account of all the information that had not been released, uh, just to make it more interesting in the chapter. Now, why is he not subject to extradition to the United States. Well, the, 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 I don't want to answer that question, but I got a bigger question. Why does that violate the, uh, why does that mean that Assange has violated the law when he published the information in question after the event that you described? Let me just be very clear about something that's complicated. Yeah. The government is making a big deal about hacking. I don't pretend to be a hacking lawyer. 
Uh, I would say that the uh, latest indictment, which talks about hacking here, hacking there, hacking everywhere, when you pull it apart, doesn't make any legal sense, but makes public relations sense for the, for the government. When it issued the first of the three indictments, it tried to get everyone's sympathy on its side by saying Assange hacked or he agreed, agreed to hack because Manning wanted him to have uh, Manning have access to so-called Cipranet, which is the, the Google of the in intelligence, intelligence world. That charge, in my humble opinion, is an absolute phony, uh, number one. Uh, number two, in showing that the uh, that uh, Assange was uh, violating the, the Hacking Act, it said that he had published all the information about the diplomatic cables uh, and, and uh, endangered everyone's safety as a consequence. But what actually happened was, as Dan said, a password to the computer storage of these documents was published by a Guardian author in a book, which was then picked up by a United States publisher. <laughs> and that publisher published all this information first and Assange published it later. All of this is, I'm sorry to say, very, very complicated, but it just proves that the government is reaching over backwards to try to get Assange for things that he really didn't do himself, at least initially. It is complicated. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Um, there's a statement that I wanted to read that came in through the through the group chat. There's so much going on there that it's some, it's a hard to catch everything. Um, but we got a comment from uh, Martha Schmidt, who's an international human rights lawyer, and she said that uh, quote the denial to defendants and their attorneys of due process rights such as the refusal of access and placement behind glass cages during a trial is not unknown in other countries outside the US and the UK. It clearly violates international human rights norms. I saw this and heard about this when I was a trial observer in the second trial of Lori Berenson in Peru. I am wondering if any trial in the US will even be open if he's extradited to the United States. Um, I wanted to share that with people and ask if um, any of the panelists have a comment about that. Well, the trial, uh, the trial will be, be generally open, but subject to closure, as was the Pentagon Papers case. Okay. <laughs> parts of it, parts of it will be closed, uh, and parts of it will be open. It, it takes me back to my old criminal trial where the first day of the trial, uh, we went in and the public section, I was going to be at the defense table, of course, the, the public section was blocked off effectively, including the press, by a huge screen, a, uh, it's never been written about it, a huge, uh, like a movie screen on which they were going to project parts of the Pentagon papers for the benefit of the jury. And the, the effect of that was going to be that the trial was in effect going to be in the screen as far as the public was concerned. And there was an objection to that to move the screen and so forth. And uh, uh, they, when they finally brought that down, uh, I remember thinking, I am being prosecuted by sinister buffoons. It seems <laughs> It's kind of a mockery, uh, you know, what's going on in London, very similar sort. Indeed. Um, Kafkaesque, and by others as a Stalinist show trial, or a kangaroo court, or a star chamber. These are the metaphors, they're not metaphors, these are the comparisons that are being raised by people who are allowed to follow the proceedings. Um, so, so a, a bunch more questions here. Um, thank you, everybody, for for putting your your questions in the chat. I'm trying to highlight as many of them as possible. Um, here's one: um, Isn't Assange accused by journalists of having published names of people that, because of that, were exposed to 
to great risks. Can you clarify that, this charge that we're hearing over and over again? He is accused of that, but as James just pointed out, uh, the names, of, first of all, they're informants. So uh, they're not uh, members of the national security state. I think that's an important point. Uh, that is a violation. Remember Valerie Plain when her name was, uh, when her name was uh, released, um, uh, largely because her husband was advocating against uh, the invasion of Iraq. Um, that is a crime. Um, but uh, informants is a far more nebulous role. That's number one. Number two, uh, and James may have something to add to this. Number two, uh, as he pointed out, these were released by Luke Harding, Harding in his book uh, in, uh, by releasing the password to the documents that was done by the Guardian correspondent, not by Julian. Well, I think this is the uh, heart of the government's uh, case. Um, I understand from reading some briefs of today's proceedings uh, that the government tried to say that he, Assange was not being pursued for publishing uh, information that violated national security or particularly the Espionage Act, but only for the names which was ex resisted heavily by the uh, uh, government. The uh, fact is that the government has never been able to show that the, there was danger uh, created for any of the names named persons uh, who were so named in the material that was published by Assange. That being the case, I don't think they can cry, cry wolf and say, they should have been endangered when in fact they weren't, that won't pass First Amendment muster. But it is clear uh, that is the heart of the case. As I understand it, the names appear in the diplomatic cables, uh, were scrubbed as Chris uh, said in the publication initially done by the Times and then released by the Guardian by mistake. The uh, other parts of the material that were published by Assange, uh, the names were scrubbed. So it's pretty much the diplomatic cables and the names there that are the heart of the case, as I see it, from a distance, I may point out. Thank you. Um, here's another question. Um, the situation is clearly outrageous, but most of us have little or no agency here. The custodians of the system are not open to persuasion. Media is increasingly controlled. What unorthodox angles of attack might be worthwhile? Well, I've got an orthodox. I'm sorry, I can't <laughs> answer. I like to think of myself unorthodox as being unorthodox and therefore what follows is that but it wouldn't help to have some truth here. I mean, we've, we have for the last 20 minutes tried to state what the facts are. Uh, the government has not stated the facts and that is why they're being attacked uh, by the defense. Sorry to give such a banal answer, but national security cases go off on fiction. Here, here. Okay. The, the prosecutor brought out yesterday that um, uh, he was that Assange was not entitled in Britain to a public interest defense. In other words, sometimes called public accountability or lesser evil or defense of necessity, uh, the defense that would allow him to speak to his motives or to the actual impact. And that's true in Britain, by the way. In their Official Secrets Act, for a period, it's gone through various modifications. And through one period, they did allow a public interest defense. And that led to the acquittal by the jury of Clive Ponting, who had revealed that Margaret Thatcher had lied when she said that the uh, battleship uh, Belgrano was uh, moving toward 
British ships and therefore had to be torpedoed and sunk, uh, when the reality was they were moving away uh, from this, were having no, and, this, and the officials knew this. So Clive Ponning revealed this, and the judge virtually ordered the jury to uh, uh, ignore that, to, to find him guilty on the basis that he had revealed classified information. And this was a case where they called a jury nullification. The jury acquitted him. And it wasn't really a nullification. They acted on the public interest defense that it presented, as a result of which the uh, parliament quickly null uh, you know, legislated out the public interest defense. Well, somebody in the trial I saw just yesterday said, well, but in the US, uh, there would be such a defense. Unfortunately, that's wrong. There never has been such an offense in connection with the Espionage Act. And as Jim has pointed out, before my case, 50 years ago, 49 years ago, uh, the Espionage Act was not used as an official secrets act, in effect. But now it is, and it is without a public interest defense. So one thing that people can do, it's urgent to do, actually, starting with journalists, but not only journalists. And that is to back some legislative proposals that have been made for such a defense to be available to any whistleblower who is accused. Uh, that could be uh, a matter of legislation, uh, parliamentary. Yohai Benkler, professor at Harvard, has written articles on public accountability defense. And it's very important to change that. Uh, so that, that's a major thing that can be done. It's not a question of repealing any espionage act of having no law against spies. That law is used against spies all the time. The point is, it should not be used against whistleblowers at all. It should be unconstitutional as now written. They should rewrite that. And second, if they find it necessary, which I would not agree, to criminalize any form of free speech other than espionage, and I, and I question whether that's necessary or worthwhile, but it can certainly be written so as to allow the whistleblower to explain their motives and the actual impact of this. And as I say, in the case of Julian in particular, when they bring up these informants' names, the fact is that Defense Secretary Gates admitted, acknowledged that there had been embarrassment, but no real harm to national security by these releases. And I can say that I was worried when this charge was first made, that he had revealed the names of informants, that there would be a headless body on the cover of Time magazine shown and with the allegation that this had been informant revealed. And no, no matter the fact that the secrecy involving these, this unconstituted, this aggressive war in Iraq, that the secrecy had led to hundreds of thousands of lives in Iraq uh, and had gotten us into there. The fact that revealing this secrecy led to one person uh, being uh, revealed would, would, would weigh heavily against Assange. But the fact is, neither in the Chelsea Manning trial nor in this have they brought out one person who was harmed. That surprised me, actually, that they weren't even able to allege that. And the person in the Defense Department who was in charge of looking into possible charges against him, you know, propaganda effort against him said they never found any evidence of harm. As I say, that was a surprise, but it certainly bears on the question of whether he was, after all, irresponsible in, uh, in revealing this information. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm a big proponent of fixing, repealing, getting rid of the Espionage Act as it is written because of the way it's been used, um, brought against uh, free press and free speech in the past, I guess, 15 years. Um, did you want to add anything, Chris, about, about tactics that folks should be, that, that those of us on participants in this call could be doing now? What can folks be doing to help Julian Assange now? Well, uh quote Kevin Aziz, I mean, so much of activism is education, um, which we're all doing today. Uh, the last time I was in London, and if, uh, I don't know whether they're having, they are having demonstrations outside the court, but the last time I was in London for the hearing, uh, there were events almost every night, which I participated in. So 
um, I think making our voices heard, especially when they're largely shut out by the mainstream media, which unfortunately has betrayed Julian. Uh, and that is about education. It's about being on the streets. It's about carrying act, out acts of nonviolent uh, civil disobedience. Uh, and that has more influence and pressure, I think, than often activists understand. I was involved with Zuccotti at Occupy Wall Street. Uh, Kevin and Margaret were with Occupy down in Washington. Uh, unfortunately, uh, large numbers of my family work on Wall Street, um, uh, my cousins. And, and But what was fascinating was how terrified they were of the Occupy movement. They were all bringing their lunches and eating it at their desks. And they had their private security firms, I know because they told me, updating them every hour. Well, now they're marching down Bond Street with a puppet, uh, like a giant squid. Um, and so we have more impact of the, than I think oftentimes we understand. And that's extremely important that we, that we raise our voices, but also we are physically present to oppose uh, you know, what's, what's being done to Julian. Uh, now in London, and I fear potentially in the United States. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Get out there in the streets. Um, so, so we're we're closing in on ninety minutes. So I'm going to um, gently wrap up our conversation, which has been phenomenal. Thank you so much to um, to all three of you for your. Um, for your amazing insights. What I'd like to do in, the, um, in our closing, I guess, seven minutes is ask each of you, um, you know, what, what last words you have to, to, to bring us out um, of this webinar. And um, I will start with you, James. Well, I would just like to reiterate what all three of us have said, that this is an extremely dangerous case uh, for free expression. It's an extremely dangerous case for the relationship between the governed and the governor and that if in fact it comes out uh, badly we're going to be a lot worse off because governments will then have or at least the United States government but I'm sure others will follow more control over their information than they did before. And though we haven't uh, focused on it, it seems to me the secure, national security system is there primarily for political purposes to keep information private about how the power of our government uh, is exercised and while the government should have some ability to do that. Certainly, it doesn't apply to the millions and millions and millions of documents that they classify as secret, so forth and so on. So the deleterious, the most deleterious consequence I can see of this whole proceeding is the government's will control information even more than they have before and use it to their private advantage and not for the advantage of the rest of us. Thank you. And, and as, they, as they limit our access to their information, they are building up the surveillance state to have ever more access to, to our information to use. Um, thank you, James. Um, Dan? What closing words do you have for us? Yes. Many people are involved in uh, preserving a republic and making it uh, worthwhile. And let me pay tribute, for example, to uh, both my panel members here, uh, colleagues. In the first place, I identify with Chelsea Manning and Ed Snowden more than with any other two people in the world. I've been in their position, our lives, the trajectory of our lives has been very similar. The ethical issues we faced are similar. We react in the same way. Uh, uh, Julian, on the other hand, is in the position of, let's say, the New York Times, uh, in my case, facilitating, making it available what I had to offer to the public, without which they would not have gotten it. And uh, in, in James was actually personally critical as we know, 
from the Council of the New York Times decision making in going ahead and facing the risks of injunction, even prosecution, and was involved there, like Julian, uh, in effect. He was like Julian's lawyer, you might say, uh, in, the, uh, in that role. So without them, without him and the, the decisions that he facilitated, uh, well, they, there was a long chain there, but it had an effect of uh, helping shorten the war. In the case of Chris, not only for his long effort as a, as a journalist, but he gave rise to one of the most surprisingly happy events of my life. Uh, he asked me to be part of a suit uh, on the uh, that he mentioned earlier against the government on the Defense Authorization Act, I think it was, which I did as a matter of form. Why not? If Chris Atchison if asked me to do it, fine, why not? Uh, you know, I get a lot of requests like that. And uh, little did I think that anything would come of it. And to my amazement, of course, what he mentioned was that a district court actually enjoined the government on the basis of this. And here was, uh, you know, uh, Hedges in Ellsberg and Chomsky on the winning side of a court case against the US government. I could hardly believe it. Uh, that was a red letter day. It so happens that in the last couple of weeks, last 10 days or so, there has been a district court decision uh, claiming that the, uh, the practices that Ed Snowden revealed of universal surveillance of Americans, which had been denied by Michael Hayden and others, Clapper rather, and others, uh, had not only occurred, but that they were illegal and probably unconstitutional. Now, what comes of that case remains to be seen, but it nevertheless does show we've got to knock on every door and Chris's uh, willingness to uh, knock on the door of the Justice Department with respect to the unconstitutional activities of the executive branch uh, is not, has a possibility of keeping us a republic. We aren't facing the likelihood of that in the next six months, I would say. It's a very great challenge. It will be a challenge to a general, I think that our president faced with defeat will take actions to which the only appropriate public reaction is a general strike. And that would have seemed totally impractical during the pandemic, although the reaction to George Floyd at whatever risk does show it's not impractical. So our Republic is in a kind of imminent danger that I can't remember ever having encountered before. And uh, definitely keeping the role of the press alive is part of our process of resistance to that. Thanks, Dan. Um, Chris, so you Julian, want to wrap us up? Julian, with three other co-authors, wrote a book uh, a couple years ago called Cypherpunks, uh, which I highly recommend, uh, because Julian understands uh, perhaps better than anyone how, in his words, we're galloping into this transnational corporate uh, dystopia, that the internet is not just a tool to educate, uh, but has become a mechanism for postmodern surveillance. Uh, and this is supranational. Uh, it's dominated by a global uh, corporate uh, power. Uh, and as they write in the book, they, 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 they will merge global humanity into one giant grid of mass surveillance and mass control. That at its core is what Julian and WikiLeaks and other Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden are really fighting against the wholesale of surveillance of all of our communications, which are permanently recorded, permanently tracked. Uh, all of our interactions are uh, followed uh, and from birth to death. And uh, that is a terrifying, it's something even Orwell couldn't imagine. That's really what we're fighting here. Uh, and the decay of democratic institutions, the seizure of power, uh, both nationally and globally by these corporate cabals that have fused themselves as Silicon Valley has with the national security state presages a really terrifying uh, new dark age. Uh, and, and that's why I, I have such deep admiration for Julian, who as Dan said, is not just someone I uh, respect and defend, but is a friend. Uh, and all of those who have had the courage to come out, uh, and let's not forget Kevin, 
uh, uh, who, who understand what's coming and have put themselves on the line as we have to put ourselves on the line uh, to uh, protect and uh, uh, reestablish an open society. Thank you, Chris. Um, thanks, thanks so much to Popular Resistance for organizing this um, event and to Chris Hedges, James Goodale and Dan Ellsberg for being part of this incredible panel. Thanks so much to everyone who joined us. Um, this this um, webinar, the video will be archived and it'll be available. I'm not exactly sure where. Certainly we'll post it on our website at um, rightsanddissent.org, but also I imagine on popular resistance. And um, thank you all so much for joining us. <laughs>